Hello, and welcome to this presentation on program evaluation. My name is Shanu Gupta. I am an academic hospitalist at the University of South Florida. This presentation was developed as part of a workshop that was delivered elsewhere. And I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who helped create this presentation. Dr. Alexandraki, Dr. Bailey, Dr. Chen, Dr. Hannah, and Dr. Smith. Today, we will be reviewing three frameworks to guide the evaluation of faculty development, and we will review appropriate methods and metrics to evaluate faculty development programs. There are many frameworks that exist for program evaluation. The three that we will discuss today are the most commonly utilized in the medical education literature. And these tools are logic model, SIP model, and the Kirkpatrick model. The logic model makes straightforward the logical links between program processes and intended outcomes. The SIP model considers holistically the program's context, inputs, processes, and products. And the Kirkpatrick model defines different levels of program outcomes, and we will discuss each of these separately. First, the logic model. This is a graphical representation of a program's theory of practices. It demonstrates connections between program processes and outcomes. It can push stakeholders to articulate hypotheses based on which a program is constructed. In other words, if, if we implement A, this will likely lead to B. The typical components of the logical model are these. The first is a description of the inputs or the resources that you will require for your program. This may include money, time, facilities, equipment, staff, partnerships with other organizations, and overall infrastructure. The next, you'll want to document what you will do with these resources. Next, you would document the output, and these are the direct products of activities, which may be development of new workshops or training modules, perhaps new documents or publications, participants that will be engaging with your activities, and any new policies that have been developed or amended. Ultimately, this will lead to outcomes, which may be changes in learning, action, or conditions. You may want to measure a change in the knowledge of your participants, or an improvement in their skills, or a change in their attitudes or behaviors. There may even be changes in environmental, social, or economic impacts as a result of your program. You will notice that the first two pieces here are a description of your planned work. The next two are really a description of your intended outcome. And the logic model depicts the path from program creation to implementation to outcome for participants. Here's a worked example. The Harvard Macy Institute delivers a program for physician educators. To measure the eff eff efficacy of this program, they utilized the logic model and they used descriptions of the inputs, the activities, the outputs, and they measured outcomes through structured telephone interviews of 20 alumni. The inputs that they documented were funding support, tuition, operational budget, faculty and staff time, and facilities where teaching occurs. The activities to fulfill its mission, they noted they had to create systems to publicize the program, to screen potential participants and manage course logistics. They had curricular components, including assessment of learning needs, a space for interactive learning and opportunities to practice those learnings, sequenced and multifaceted activities and outcome evaluations. They also created space to foster medical educator communities of practice. And they had ongoing curricular updates and program evaluation. The outputs from these program activities, they measured the number of applicants and participants. They measured the average time a participant spent on program activities, and they measured the number of hits on program websites. For outcomes, they measured immediate and intermediate benefits for the participants during and after program activities. In those structured interviews that I mentioned earlier, they understood that 81% of the respondents reported increased knowledge about and confidence using learning-centered teaching methods. 63% said they gave fewer lectures and added alternative educational methods. 81% reported a stronger commitment to the field of medical education, 
almost a third felt that the program was a turning point in their careers. And thus they were able to measure pedagogical knowledge gains, commitment to medical education career and identity, and a sense of an expanded network. The logic model approach is really useful in depicting program creation, program implementation, outcomes for participants. However, it can be challenging to generate evidence for causal linkages of program activities to outcomes. If carefully implemented, however, it can give lots of information and data about the program and the subsequent outcomes that can be utilized to help support your program needs. Next, let's talk about the SIP model. The SIP model is an acronym. C is context evaluation or what needs to be done. This is where you would want to document the, what are the training needs, what are the program goals, how is the learning environment for implementing the program. The input evaluation is where you would document how should it be done. This is where you would assess work plans, assess for competing strategies, and develop budgets of selected approaches. You may want to start by investigating existing similar programs. You may devise program strategy. You may assess the program's responsiveness to assess needs, budget, and feasibility. You may want to compare with alternative strategies, and you may want to develop a work plan to solicit stakeholders' input and finalize the work plan. The first P is process evaluation. Is it being done? So as you are delivering your content, you will want to monitor, document, and assess the program activities. The final P is product evaluation. So did it succeed? This is where you would assess short-term, long-term, intended, and unintended outcomes. Here's a worked example. The Stanford Anesthesiology Faculty Teaching Scholars Program it wanted to evaluate the effective, effectiveness of their program, and they did so by creating a survey that they sent out to their participants, and they utilized the SIP model to help them identify components of the survey that helped them understand how their program performed. So as a result of this survey, they were able to identify that the context that allowed participants to attend this program some of it was to do with the reason for participation, which included things like upskilling their teaching skills. Some had no previous experience in medical education and wanted some. Some noticed a gap in resident education and they wanted to have an impact by skilling themselves up in curriculum development. For input evaluation, the participants were able to recognize and give feedback on benefits and negatives of the lecture series that were delivered to them. They were able to talk about the availability of resources that were offered to them and the adequacy of the non-clinical time in helping them participate in this program, which included a longitudinal project. For process evaluation, the survey respondents were able to give them information about resident participation um, during their own practice of new teaching skills, the mentorship that was given to them as part of the program, and they were able to identify barriers to implementation of all of these new concepts. For product evaluation, they were able to, the survey respondents were able to tell the, um, these researchers about their rate of project completion. They were able to give them feedback on the positive and negative outcomes of the program altogether in their practice. They were able to discuss the educational sustainability as a result of this practice. They're also able to offer suggestions for improvement. The SIP model's process evaluation study is invaluable for supporting accountability to program stakeholders, and it allows for the data collected necessary for a program's continual improvement. It does, however, require careful planning. It can be quite useful to use the SIP model as you're creating and developing a new program, but you can use it for retrospective evaluations of a completed program also. Multiple data collection methods are usually required to do a good job of a SIP study, and each data set must be analyzed with methods appropriate to the data and also appropriate to the question being addressed. Personally, I really value this particular model because it helps me, um, it helps me as I'm creating the program, it helps me as I'm implementing the program, and it really acts as a CQI, a continuous QI process for me as I'm delivering content. Finally, let's look at the Kirkpatrick model. And this may be one that you're already familiar with. 
as mentioned previously, the Kirkpatrick model is really looking at participant level outcomes. And these are sort of in a pyramid frame. The very base of the pyramid is level one, which is really assessing reaction. In other words, are faculty satisfied with their experiences? Do they find the program enjoyable? Level two is a slightly higher level of outcome, and this may be changes in learning. This is where you may want to assess the gains in knowledge and skills, changes in attitudes, confidence, and conceptions of teaching. Level three is looking at behavior, and this is where you would assess faculty's application of what they have learned to their teaching. And level four is results, and this is where you may want to measure impact on the students of the faculty that you have trained, and perhaps institutional impact as well. Here is a worked model, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars National Leadership Institute wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of their program and they utilized the Kirkpatrick model to help them understand participants' outcomes. For level one, they surveyed their participants to understand whether they were satisfied with the program, whether they found it relevant, and what utility they felt this program had for them. For level two, they did a retrospective pre-post test of the competencies that were delivered in, in the program, specifically associated with health equity or health equity-centered leadership development. For level three, they looked at behaviors. The participants were, during the program, required to submit online wisdom logs, and they noted 140 unique statements that describe the use of the eight competencies associated with equity, diversity, and inclusion that were taught in the program. For level four results, the participants did a most significant change evaluation where they submitted 27 stories with equity, diversity, and inclusion as a top theme. Participants reported advocating for historically marginalized populations, teaching others, creating partnerships to address health equity issues, and expanding self-discovery around their own engagement with equity, diversity, and inclusion. A second piece of measuring impact, they tracked um, reported leadership activities, and this data was collected via multiple strategies, including direct communications from the participants to the program staff, targeted Google alerts on their participants to see if they had changed roles, online submission forms and annual reviews of CVs and resumes to see if their participants had taken on new leadership roles after completing this program. So you can see that the Kirkpatrick model is excellent in measuring outcomes at all levels, but it's unlikely to guide you into a full evaluation of your educational program or to provide data to illuminate why a program works. I would suggest you utilize this Kirkpatrick's model in conjunction with other models like the SIP or the LOGIC. As you noticed at the, at the end of, towards the end of both of those were the outcomes that were being measured. And that's where plugging this model might actually be helpful in completing a more holistic review. Which one to choose? I would suggest choose one and do it. Like anything else in medicine, practice makes perfect. So pick one and start doing it. And you may find benefits to either one. While we're at it, let's talk about some methods and metrics. When you're thinking about how to measure and what to measure, do not limit evaluation to what can be counted, such as number of attendees or workshops, self-reported participant reactions such as satisfaction. These will limit value and effectiveness of evaluation. Instead, think about collecting longitudinal data. What is the knowledge retention of your participants? How does that knowledge transfer to the workplace? In other words, are they starting to utilize new teaching methods that they weren't before? Think about enabling and inhibiting factors. For example, are there awards that are helping up enable these behaviors or other resources? and reflect on program outcomes and make changes as needed as you do CQI for your programs. Also consider the organizational context in mind. What are the institutional cultures and processes that may affect programmatic outcomes? Think about the program drivers. Are there institutional needs that could be affected through this program? Are there accreditation requirements that you could be participating in? What is a workplace culture and how does that promote what you will be delivering in your program 
And what on off the program, off the workplace culture, will you be anticipating changing as a result of your program? Be mindful of resources, both financial and human. What might be the costs in both of those domains as a result of your program? And utilize existing collegial networks and build new ones as needed. In my context, I exist in a university where we have multiple colleges and some have other resources that we do not have in our College of Medicine. So sometimes leveraging those resources can be really helpful and a cost saving too. Think about diversifying your evaluation methods. Keep in mind the drawbacks of common evaluation methods and metric metrics. Surveys tend to be an easy place for us to go to, but over surveying program participants can lead to survey fatigue. Surveys can have inherent biases in them, and you can often get low response rates. Self-reported outcomes such as satisfaction also may be insufficient to draw valid conclusions. Consider using rigorous qualitative and quantitative methods. As we saw in some of our previous examples, there are participant interviews or focus groups that can be used to get at some of this information. You can also do direct observations, assessments, and even video recordings. You can collect data from other stakeholders like your participants' students, your participants' patients, supervisors, unit coordinators, institutional leaders. When you're thinking about institutional metrics, consider academic advancement and promotion and how your program may help with that. You may also want to measure leadership positions and roles after the program has been completed as a way to measure success. And of course, things like publications that result from participating in the program, grants or presentations, and not just from the direct content that was delivered in the program, but maybe even the networks that were created, collaborative practices that happened as a result of the program. These are all measures of success for your program. Do try to utilize validated instruments as much as possible. Instruments that lack evidence of validity and reliability can be challenging. Uh, they can introduce bias and they can affect credibility of your results. Use existing instruments that have been validated if they're available and appropriate, but keep in mind that an instrument may not be transferable depending on the context and revalidation may be necessary. Don't forget to utilize your librarians to help you identify validated instruments that may already exist. A scoping review that was performed by Alexandraki et al on what the evaluation landscape looks like of faculty development programs. The scoping review recognized that there were a variety of faculty development programs currently out there that teach teaching skills, leadership skills, research and scholarship skills, or a combination of all of the above. The program evaluation tool most commonly utilized across programs was surveys. No surprise there. There were also some self-reported outcomes which included participants' perceptions of program quality and effectiveness, their own perceptions of changes in their knowledge, skills, and attitudes and behaviors as a result of participating in the program. As you can see, these are all sort of lower level if we think about the Kirkpatrick model, and there are opportunities and gaps in improving the level of outcome that is being measured here. And so I encourage you to utilize different frameworks Know that many exist, but the three that we talked about today were Logic, SIP, and Kirkpatrick. Know that the Kirkpatrick model in itself may be limited in its use, but can be very valuable if used with SIP or Logic. And when you're looking at metrics, do try to diversify as much as possible. Use a mixture of quantitative and qualitative. Consider utilizing longitudinal measures. Think about including organizational needs, both from the participant perspective and from the organization perspective. And think about using validated instruments as you go through this work. Good luck with your program evaluations. And please do reach out. I'd love to help you if I can. Thank you.